Hey everyone, I'm Mark and today we're going to have a look at one of the most useful tools to reduce your workload when you're just learning a new plane with a glass cockpit by looking at the most useful features of the G1000 Autopilot. One of the neat things about the G1000 is that it doesn't matter whether you're flying a C172, a DA62 like I am today, or anything else really because the functionality, buttons, and the overall layout will be almost identical, which makes it easy to jump from one plane to the other. We're going to be doing a short hop from St. Martin down to St. Kitts to explore all of the most commonly used lateral and vertical modes from the heading and nav modes to flight level change and vertical speed and even more subtle things like the flight director and the yaw damper as well. In terms of our flight plan, I prepared it ahead of time and it's quite basic with just our departure and arrival airports and the single waypoint between the two. But that's actually all that we need to explore all the different autopilot modes, so we can send that over to the avionics now. Before we head off though, it's always a good idea to double check that everything got loaded up properly. So what we can do is head over to the multifunction display for that. And then from here, if I bring up the flight plan page, we've got our exact same route as the EFB, so that's all good. From there, if we close out the flight plan and we zoom out a little bit, we can see our whole route ahead of us with the magenta line. And the first thing that we're going to look at today is how to make the autopilot follow that flight path. So what I'm going to do is get everything running and I'll meet you on the runway for takeoff. As we get airborne, the first thing that I want to quickly point out is the yaw damper, which is a feature that's only available on more modern G1000 planes like this one. What the yaw damper does is it takes care of any changes in the yaw rate, which is when the nose goes left to right by making small rudder inputs to counter it any time that you make a turn. That means that you don't have to touch your rudder pedals once it's enabled and I'll typically turn it on once I'm about 300 feet above ground level and it'll stay on until the approach. It's not made for use during takeoff and landing though so you want to make sure that it is off for both of those because you would be fighting it with your own rudder adjustments and some planes like the SR-22 and the Vision Jet will actually turn it on and off automatically for you just so you don't forget about it. Now normally I wouldn't engage the autopilot until I'm well into my climb just because it's going to be a whole lot more fun to hand fly, but for the purposes of the video we'll enable it now to start looking at it. The autopilot defaults to the two most basic vertical and lateral modes that it has, with the first of those being pitch mode, meaning that it'll maintain the pitch attitude that you have it in at the moment you turn the autopilot on. So when I turned it on, I was around 5 degrees nose up at the time, so it's going to stay like that until I enable another vertical mode. The other mode that it defaults to is roll mode, which means that if you enable it when your wings level, it'll stay wings level. But on the other hand, if you enable it when you're in a turn, even a very slight one, it'll keep the wings there until you enable another lateral mode. You can always tell what attitude it's keeping you in by looking at what the flight director, aka the magenta chevron in the center of the PFD is doing. And if you enabled it when you were in a steep turn or 20 degrees nose up, for example, you can use the next modes that we're going to look at to fix that. That next lateral mode that we're going to look at is heading mode, but before we enable it, it's important to check where our heading bug is pointing right now, because otherwise you could find yourself turning in a direction that you don't want, which is especially important when there's mountains around. You can snap the heading bug to your current heading by pressing the top of the heading dial, otherwise you can just simply turn the dial either left or right to bring it there yourself, and the choice is really up to you. Now that that's set, we can enable heading mode and that'll give us a green heading mode indication in the flight mode enunciator and it'll keep us flying on our current heading since that's where we just set our heading bug. When we want to make a turn, we can turn the heading bug in the direction that we want and the plane will follow it and level out the wings once it gets to that new heading that we set. If you have a flight plan loaded into the avionics like we did earlier or via mission and career mode, you can use heading mode to get back on course by either looking at your map, or to be more precise about it, you can use the HSI. 
the HSI actually shows you the same information as the map. It's just a top down view, which you're playing in the middle, but it's a more precise layout and learning how to interpret it is a pretty important skill if you're going to be doing any type of instrument flying. First off, we've got the magenta arrow at the top here that points to the track that we need to fly across the ground to get from our previous waypoint, which was the airport, directly to our next waypoint, which is our en route waypoint that we loaded up. The magenta line that's off to the right of our plane represents our flight path that we want to follow to our destination. And right now it's deflected a fair bit off to the right, which is its way of telling us that we're off course. And the more deflected it gets, the further off track we actually are. That's actually what the cross track number at the middle is telling us. So right now we're about nine miles offset from our planned flight path and it's getting further by the second. Now to get back on course, based on what we see in the HSI, our plane is to the left of the flight path, so we need to turn to the right to fly towards it. How much we turn in that direction is going to depend on how far off track we actually are, but you'll typically use between 10 and 30 degrees, although at times if you're really far off, you could go as much as 45 degrees or more. We're a fair bit off track today, so it'll take a couple of minutes for us to get back to the flight path, but you can already see the cross track number is getting smaller and the flight path needle should start slowly moving back towards our airplane too. As the needle continues to center itself, we can use our heading bug to progressively get back towards our track to the next waypoint. However, that's actually where nav mode comes into play because it'll do the job of keeping you on the right track to follow your flight plan automatically. I've just enabled nav mode now and if we look at the FMA, heading mode is still the active mode, but in white right next to that you can see that it's arm GPS navigation and when we get a little bit closer to our flight path it'll actually start to flash and turn green. It's at this point that it's captured our course from point A to point B and you can see that our flight path needle is almost back at the center of the HSI and the plane is automatically starting to turn itself back towards our direct track to the waypoint. So at this point with the flight path needle overlapping our plane in the middle of the HSI we're right on track and the autopilot will keep it that way until we get to our destination. That'll cover it for heading and nav mode, so let's start looking at our vertical modes now. And the first thing that I want to point out is how to set your target cruise altitude in the autopilot, which you do with the altitude dial that's right here. The outer dial lets you change it in thousands of feet and the inner dial in hundreds with every change that you make reflected in the PFD right here. And it's actually best to set your initial climb altitude before you get underway, but you can obviously change it at any time. We're still in pitch mode from back when we enabled the autopilot, but we've actually got two other modes that we can use. And we'll start by looking at flight level change, which is the mode that I actually end up using the most for climbing because it protects you from climbing out too fast. The way that it works is that you give it a target airspeed that it should hold, which is displayed right here at the top of the airspeed tape. And then the plane is going to give you the best climb rate that it can while maintaining that speed. At times, that can mean that your climb rate will be low like it is right now, but what you can do at that point is lower your target airspeed with the down key and that'll tell the autopilot to trade your airspeed for a better climb rate. For example, if I bring our target speed down from 128 to 120, it'll increase the pitch of the plane so that it can slow down to our new target speed. That higher pitch is giving us a better climb rate and once it reaches our new target speed of 120, it'll readjust the pitch again to maintain that new speed. The other way that you can increase your climb rate in flight level change without having to change the target airspeed is to increase throttle because the plane can convert that energy into a higher climb rate while maintaining your current speed, but obviously you're going to be limited by the maximum thrust of the engine in that scenario. You can also use flight level change on the descent as well, but at that point everything is going to be reversed. So if you want to increase your descent rate, you actually need to increase your airspeed. Or the other option is to reduce power so that it can maintain your target speed while increasing the descent rate.
The alternative to flight level change is to instead use vertical speed, which when you enable it with the button right here will show you the climb rate that it's using at the top of the vertical speed tape. If you're already in a climb or a descent for that matter, it defaults to the vertical speed that you're currently at. But just like with flight level change, you use the nose up and nose down keys to adjust how fast you're climbing or descending. Unlike flight level change though, you can very easily get yourself in trouble with vertical speed because it won't protect you from a steep climb that it can't hold and it'll very happily trade all of your airspeed to maintain the vertical speed that you told it. For that reason, it's always important to keep an eye on your airspeed and adjust the throttle as needed when you adjust your vertical speed so that you don't get too slow in a climb or too fast in a descent. I tend to use vertical speed when I need to make a quick change to my altitude, say if I've leveled off a little bit too early or I need to climb up quickly for some reason, it's really going to be your best bet in that situation. For longer climbs of a couple thousand feet though, I find that flight level change is a better choice because you often aren't in a rush to get there and you don't have to worry about it out climbing the plane like you do at vertical speed. Now because we set our level off altitude earlier, regardless of if you're in vertical speed or flight level change, the plane is going to level off automatically for you when it gets to that altitude. If at any point you need to level off quickly and you're already in a climb or a descent with either mode, the altitude button will do just that by immediately leveling you off at whatever altitude that you're currently at. It'll do that by changing your target altitude though, so if you need to continue your climb afterwards, you'll have to reset your altitude again using the dials. My biggest tip when it comes to the autopilot though is that if at any point you find yourself confused as to what's going on, always go back to check what the green modes are on the FMA because that's going to give you a clear picture as to what's going on at that exact moment. You'll also be able to tell what's going to happen next if you armed another mode but it hasn't captured yet, so it's really a one-stop shop to know what the autopilot is doing. Overall, I find that keeping the autopilot on until I'm on final makes the most sense for me because it frees me up to do other things like loading an approach, reviewing a chart, setting up for landing, and pretty much everything else in between as well. Typically, as I'm getting close to my arrival airport, I'll use heading mode and vertical speed to get myself in the right spot to shoot the approach, but when I'm ready to go hands-on, I'll start by disabling the autopilot, and you'll notice that it flashes in yellow in the FMA to tell you that it's disabled. From there, if you have an approach loaded, the Magenta Flight Director will still give you guidance as to where you should put your nose to follow it down to the runway, but if you're not going to be using it, you should turn it off to declutter the primary flight display. If you need help with how to do visual approaches with the G1000, I've covered how to do that in my G1000 navigation video, as well as how to use VNAV, so I'll leave you today with links to those, and please make sure to like and subscribe if you learned something useful today.